Hey, what's up, everyone? I'm super excited to kick off another episode of the Twimmel AI podcast. I am, of course, your host, Sam Charrington. And today I am coming to you live from the Future Frequency podcast studio at the AWS reInvent conference in Las Vegas, Nevada. I am joined by Michael Kearns. Uh, Michael is a professor in the Department of Computer and Information Science at UPenn, as well as an Amazon scholar with a focus on fairness and privacy in machine learning and related topics at AWS. Uh, a quick note, if I sound a little funny, do not try to adjust your audio settings, it is me. Uh, after a few days here at reInvent and in this uh, zero humidity desert, my usual podcast voice is given away to a little bit of a Barry White uh, slow jams voice. Um, but before we get going, be sure to take a moment to hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening to today's show. And if you want to check out the studio, you can bounce over to YouTube to check us out. Michael, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Great to be here. It's great to have you on the show. We had the, pr the pleasure of sitting next to one another at a dinner uh, a couple of months ago, I guess, yeah. uh, in New York and had a great conversation. Yeah, I'm going to struggle to try and re you know, recreate <laughs> a lot of that conversation because um, we touched we touched on, you know, everything from philosophy to your work, of course. Um, but, you know, thanks once again for, for joining me here. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Uh, I'd love to get started by having you share a little bit about your background and how you came to work in machine learning. Yeah. Um, so first of all, um, I'm an old timer. I've been around a long time. <laughs> and so I went to graduate school in the late 1980s, just to set the context for your listeners who might be considerably younger these days. Um, the field of machine learning barely existed in the late 1980s. Uh -huh. um, the conferences that we now know as NeurIPS and ICML were really in their first couple of years at that point. And machine learning at that time was considered sort of a a, a, a boutique, obscure subfield of the then discredited larger field of AI, which was going through its <laughs> famous AI winter. winter. So suffice to say, I've seen a lot of change in my career. I initially came to machine learning from really an algorithmic and theoretical angle. So in those early days when, you know, machine learning barely existed, in particular, there weren't sort of formal foundations or models for thinking about machine learning the way we're used to now. Mm -hmm. And at that time, there was also, of course, the ongoing kind of debate between people that came to AI from a more logical formalism and those that were starting to adopt a more probabilistic formalism, which, of course, is by far and away dominated, um, dominated today. today. And so at that time, there were very few ways of thinking rigorously about machine learning and making comparisons between different algorithms, or even saying what would constitute good performance for an algorithm. And as somebody who came to computer science in general, really through the theoretical computer science approach, um, you know, I, I liked theoretical computer science a lot and still do, but I, I was always interested in its application to sort of unusual areas. So a lot of theoretical computer science is about very practical algorithmic problems like, you know, traveling salesmen, for mm -hmm. instance. And I knew that wasn't kind of my bag. And so I you know, went to graduate school, particularly to work with a, um, somebody who was starting to think, my advisor, Les Valiant, who was starting to think about kind of mathematical ways and algorithmic ways of thinking about machine learning. And so I did that and then you know, spent the first decade of my career at the late great think tank Bell Laboratories in Murray Hill, New Jersey, mm -hmm. where, by the way, a lot of you know, um, major the luminaries of the field like Yannick LeCun were colleagues and Rob Shapiri and Vladimir Vapnik. Um, it was just a, a golden era for the early days of machine learning, had oh, great yeah. colleagues and all of our time to do research and eventually we all migrated you know, to universities and then in some cases back to industry as well. But that's sort of how I came to the topic. I don't recall if I mentioned to you that I did a summer at Bell Labs. I was based in Whippany, okay. uh, New Jersey, um, during grad school. Okay. I was focused on st statistical modeling of computer networks. Okay, and yeah, yeah. We were doing it, a lot it was cool just a, it was a gr it was a great place. It was, I mean, it still so, exists, but it's not it's, it's not, the, it's not same. the same. Yeah, it's not yeah. The same. It was a wonderful and I, I, I didn't think of it this way at the time, but it was a great alternative to being a junior faculty member somewhere uh -huh. because you know um, you had all of your time for research you didn't need to think about teaching or sitting on committees or writing grants or the like and so in some ways if you were really dialed in on your research you could be much more productive from a research perspective than you could have been in mm -hmm. an analogous position as a junior faculty member where you would have had all of these other you know concerns as well as the pressure of getting tenure 
And as you mentioned, the brain trust there was just it was incredible. great. It was great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all of us, whenever we get together, and you know, we we try to do that at the big conferences when we're all there. We are always, you know, immediately devolved into reminiscing and <laughs> t- telling stories from that decade. It was great. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, tell us a little bit about the focus of your research nowadays. Yeah. So, you know, I've been working in machine learning for a long time, and as 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 time has gone on, I've kind of evolved a bit too. And so, even though I still kind of come at many problems primarily from a mathematical algorithmic perspective first, I do get involved in quite a bit of experimental work. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I, th- I think like everyone else in machine learning, I've watched roughly the last decade with, you know, some amount of surprise and alarm. <laughs> I mean, this field that was nothing when I started in it is now this successful standalone industry. Um, and, you know, just to give some subjective history of, let's say, the time since early, you know, early 2010s when deep learning first started to become a powerful technology, you know, I think I, along with me and, you know, my colleagues kind of shared in the excitement of that initial period and, you know, big problems being solved that had, um, you know, before, before that been very intractable. Um, and then, you know, around 2015 or 2016, all of us scientists at the same time that society learned it realized that there are harmful side effects to trained models in ML if one is not careful. Um, mm-hmm. And so there was a bit of a buzzkill, I think, around you know, 2015, 2016. And you know, like many of my colleagues, I think my first thought about this is like, okay, these are serious problems. We do not want to be training models that are you know, making consequential decisions about ordinary people that exhibit you know, significant demographic bias, for instance. And being a scientist, first and foremost, my first thought on this topic was to think about technical solutions to those problems. You know, in other words, if we don't like something about the behavior of our trained models, I mean, after all, we trained them. So we could think about changing the way we train them in the first place rather than waiting for harms to occur and then looking for non-technical solutions. Yeah. I think I've come to appreciate, especially in the time I've spent at Amazon, that you need non-technical solutions as well, and that includes you know, diversity of input to the design process of products and services, diversity of technical teams that are training models. You need people with legal, regulatory, public policy backgrounds as well. But, but the way I got into kind of what, what is now called responsible AI was primarily first thinking about how could we change the way we do ML in a way that would mitigate things like demographic bias, privacy leaks, and the like. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we'll return and jump deeper into uh, your research on those areas. But before we do, uh, share a little bit about your role at Amazon. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm, first of all, part of this very clever mechanism that Amazon has <laughs> called the Amazon Scholar Program which makes it very, very flexible and easy for people like me to spend significant time at Amazon while firmly maintaining our roles in academia and also to be able to ramp, you know, sort of our commitment level to Amazon up and down. So, for example, you know... um, Utility academics. Yes, exactly. (laughs) And so, uh, right, right. Um, uh, And so I've spent the last three summers full-time at Amazon and I'm quite involved during the year. And so I, I'm basically part of a constellation of teams within AWS that think seriously about many different aspects of responsible AI. One of those teams is a centralized team that um, I participated in the formation of when I joined back in the summer of 2020, um, which is designed to be a centralized team that works with the product and service teams on careful quantitative assessments of different responsible AI principles in our trained models and services. So this would include things like demographic fairness. It would include things like thinking about, you know, whether what are the risks of that a trained model might exfiltrate inadvertently properties of the training data, for example. We think about robustness, explainability, you know, all the things you hear about yeah. um, when the topic of responsible AI is mentioned. You know, I I should note that even prior to my arrival, um, when I got there, it was very clear to me that many of the product and service teams um, were already doing this kind of work, even though it wasn't called responsible AI at the time, uh, very seriously on their own. So, for example, when I started talking to people who work on Amazon Transcribe, which is our speech transcription service, you know, I, I, 
the first thing I learned that surprised me is that just in North American English alone, there are dozens and dozens of regional accents and dialects. Mm -hmm. And each one of these has different properties and presents different challenges for speech recognition and transcription. And so long before I showed up, that team diligently goes out and collects and annotates spoken tra you know spoken data that's then transcripted by transcribed by humans in order to do both bias assessments and to improve training of our models what was different about this centralized team was that there were a couple of, of reasons for it one was it felt that this topic was becoming sufficiently important and serious that it merited having a centralized team that first of all had a certain arm's length objectivity and distance from the product teams themselves. But of course, we need to work with the product and service teams on these audits, and then the other part of this centralized team um, is meant to sort of codify best practices, collect data sets that might be able to be used for assessments on multiple different products and services, and eventually, I think, develop platforms and tooling around responsible AI that can be turned back to the product teams to make their work more efficient and, and higher quality. And so that's, that's sort of the science end of the work I do at Amazon, but then I often get pulled into discussions about, you know, how we talk about responsible AI in public via PR and, you know, analyst relations, um, had, get occasionally involved in public policy discussions and legal and regulatory discussions, and that's an entirely, you know, that's a very interesting evolving landscape itself that I think we'll see a lot of important developments in the next five years or so. And this is kind of a, 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 an approximate description of my portfolio within AWS. With that in mind, maybe one of the things we can jump into is uh, the announcement here this week of the service cards. It was part of a broader umbrella of ML governance capabilities that was uh, announced as part of the, the SageMaker uh, product family. Uh, of course, you know, I'm presuming by name alone that, you know, credit, you know, goes to folks behind the original model cards paper. Absolutely. Like uh, Deb Raji and Meg Mitchell, yep. Tim McEbrew and, yeah. and others. Right. Can you talk a little bit about that? And Yeah, so first of all, there were two related but distinct announcements today. One was on sort of model cards within SageMaker. Uh -huh. And that's, of course, really customer facing. That's for our customers who have their own data, have the expertise to do their own machine learning but wants to do machine learning in a responsible way. So SageMaker model cards is meant to help our customers in that regard. And okay. I'm a little bit more distant from that effort. Okay. On the other hand, the service cards that we announced for three of our major kind of vertical AI services around face recognition, um, speech transcription, and um, uh, identity validation from like government identities, okay. um, government ID cards. Um, these are closely related to model cards, and obviously that particular paper was an inspiration not just to us, but I think to many people in the responsible AI community. Um, you'll notice that we don't call those model cards, though we call them service cards, and there's okay. a very deliberate reason for that. One of them is our typical AI service will have many, many models behind it. To give a very concrete example, if you think about the problem of face recognition, you know, a good face recognition engine will deploy multiple models. There will be one model that just identifies the bounding boxes around the faces in an image. There will be perhaps a separate model which makes adjustments to those faces. For instance, if your head was tilted in your selfie, it'll write it so that it's oriented properly. Um, and then, of course, there's finally the model which is actually doing the matching and deciding whether this face matches, you know, the one that's on file for you, for yeah. example. And so since our customers and the end users of our customers experience like the holistic system end to end, not the individual models, we call them service cards because they're really like model cards, but for the entire service, right? The thing that you would kind of experience at the API level. Makes and, a lot of sense. And yeah. thanks for that distinction. I had not heard the service cards announcement. Uh, okay. Yeah. And so when you mentioned yeah. the service cards yeah. earlier, I thought we were using two different names for yeah, model yeah, cards. Yeah, so they're, they're related but distinct. Yeah. And, um, and so to say a little bit more about them, um, you know, so 
first of all, a lot of work went into these cards. Um, first of all, there's the underlying technical quantitative assessments that sort of form the qu quantitative backbone of the information on the service cards. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, you know, these cards got reviewed by many non-technical people as well and many stakeholders, you know, including legal need to weigh in on it as well. So it's been a very interesting process because it's been a, you know, internally a very diverse multidisciplinary process to kind of converge on on what we wanted to put on these cards. And I just just hearing that it sounds like the cards kind of worked as designed. It was not taking information that you already had produced and, you know, formatting it according to some card. The car the the process of creating the service card inspired some set of work beyond what was already in place for these services. Yeah, although I would say that the technical work, you know, the, the, the actual assessments of things like bias or robustness or privacy, that work's been ongoing since long before I even showed up at okay. Amazon, okay? And, and so, you know, what I think the most important thing about this announcement is that um, we're committing to doing this on an ongoing basis, right? Mm -hmm. We're like setting a standard for ourselves. Yeah. And when you look at the cards, which have actually been released, right, th there's a couple of purposes they serve. First and foremost, it's to communicate information to our customers about some details about how the models were trained, how we perceive the intended use case, what we in perceive the intended use cases to be, um, a little bit about, you know, qu our quantitative assessments of demographic bias, and we can talk a little bit more about what we say there and what we don't say and why, and I think mm -hmm. there are sort of good reasons for why we say the amount that we say now. Um, but all that being said, I think this is a, you know, this is a baby step for us, uh, but it's a big baby step for us, and I think that the most important part is the commitment to do this for sort of all of our AI services going forward, and not just to do it once and say like, okay, now we've done it for transcribe, we're, you know, check that off, because use cases change, the data being fed to these services change, um, and, and so these cards, we need to revisit them at some cadence and redo the quantitative assessments, redo the language on, and the guidance that we provide to customers on the cards. Mm -hmm. And so that's, I think, what I'm most excited about, which is, you know, there's the thing that, the, the literal cards that were released today, but then there's the commitment to a process, and I think that that is in many ways the thing that will have the greatest internal traction within AWS because we've, you know, we've kind of, as the saying goes in Amazon, we've walked through a one-way door. Mm -hmm. And and because we're walking through a one-way -way door, I think we are, uh, you know, in my view as a scientist, we're, you know, naturally a bit conservative about how much detail we reveal at the beginning. But I personally, I strongly expect that over time, it's not just that we'll do more of these cards and revisit the ones we've already done. I think the information on them will evolve and it'll evolve in a way that starts providing more quantitative detail as we go forward. So this is like our, our first dipping of the toe in the water. On that last point, you're referring to the detail that you're providing about the services that are documented in the card as opposed to the details of the process of creating the cards? Yeah, yeah, um, and so, but I think both will evolve, right? I mean, I mm -hmm. think the language that we, that we use in the cards, the the way, you know, and, and also the amount that we, the amount of detail we provide on the underlying sort of quantitative assessments that are in some ways the technical backbone of the cards. Mm -hmm. You mentioned some nuances uh, in the, the way that you present certain measurements. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so, um, a couple things. Um, so first of all, there was a lot of healthy internal discussion and debate about how much and what to say about our demographic bias assessments, which are quite extensive, you know, if I were to show you the full details of them. Um, in the end, we decided to, you know, give information about what the demographic groups we investigated were. And of course, these vary radically sometimes by service, right? Because in something like a face recognition service, you have, you know, you you can you have visible features like skin tone, hair length, jewelry, things like this, mm -hmm. that are you know correlated with different demographic groups. In spoken language, you don't have that, right? But you do have regional accents and dialects. So, right. like, what groups you're going to kind of audit for, for lack of a better term, and what kinds of data sets you're going to curate to do that assessment, are going to vary radically by different services. 
Um, there was debate, you know, about whether we should release information like, okay, you know, on this service, the worst performing group among these demographic groups was such and such group. And I think there's two very good reasons that in the end we decided not to do that at this point. One is, is that the honest scientific truth is that the identity of the group with the worst performance and what that worst performance looks like can vary radically from data set to data set. So it really can be the case that just on the problem of speech recognition, you know, different benchmark data sets, the, the group that is the best performing and the work group that has the worst performance can completely change from one data set to another. Um, the other comment I think that's worth making is that, and this is again some sort of a lesson I've learned at Amazon, the vast majority of kind of fairness notions in the scientific literature on, on the topic essentially adopt some kind of equalization of harm notion. It's like, okay, we're building a model for consumer lending. We think the biggest harm is like a false, is a false negative. I, I, I predict that you will not repay a loan and so I don't give it one to you, whereas in fact you were credit worthy and would have repaid it. Mm -hmm. And so then I settled at something like, okay, across these different combinations of racial and gender groups, I want to equalize the false rejection rate across different groups, okay? And I, I think we healthily don't think that way within AWS, and the reason for that is a, a couplefold. First of all, it can just be the case, right, that some groups present a greater challenge on a particular problem to another group. And so if you insist on equalizing rates of harm across different groups, it could be that the only way you can achieve that is to deliberately do worse on groups that you're doing better on in order to raise their rate of harm up to match that of the worst performing group. What's an example of that? I think the simplest example would be, it may not always be this way, but in general, things like, you know, facial hair and sunglasses present a challenge to face recognition, right? Because there's some kind of occlusion of your underlying facial structure, okay? That may not always be the case, by the way. Maybe at some point we'll figure out ways, for instance, of you know, detecting bone structure better in a way that would let us kind of see through facial hair. But to the extent that it makes sense to people that right now facial hair makes face recognition more difficult, if there's a culture or a demographic group in which that is common, it's going to be, you know, that's, it's going to be a, it's a harder challenge from a scientific standpoint. So the view we adopt instead, rather than saying like, well, you know, success is when we equalize the error rates across groups, our goal is to make every error group error rate as small as we possibly can, even if that doesn't mean that we can equalize all of them. And we don't want to do the sort of nonsensical thing from a product and performance standpoint of, you know, in the interests of some academic notion of fairness, deliberately doing worse on some group. And so the technical work that goes under that, of course, involves, you know, you find out what your worst performing group is, and usually, not always, but usually, the best solution to get an improvement on that group is to go out and get better and more data for that particular group. But it's because of these two reasons. One is that we don't think in this equalization term, and also what the worst and best performing groups are can change radically from data set to data set. We give kind of high level guidance on like what the worst performing group number was, but without sort of saying this was the specific group that witnessed that number. Now you could have provided additional information and specified the data set. Why did you choose not to do that? Yeah, um, there was also a healthy internal debate about how much to say about data sets. And I think in the initial cards that we're releasing today, we say relatively little about that. Mm -hmm. Part of that is because, um, you know, first of all, many, many data sets go into the training of our models as well as the assessment sure. and, you know, quite often, there, there's many more assessment data sets than there were, or at least they're very designed to be different, right? Because you're mm -hmm. essentially trying to do stress tests of models. So, you know, you normally would expect to get very good performance on the type of data that you trained on, but when you start yeah. stress testing different use cases, um, things will deliberately will look worse. Um, I think there was also the fear that since so much goes into the training of um, an ML model and your technical um, viewers will know this, you know, 
the, the cartoon view of machine learning is that it's a very streamlined, almost button pushing <laughs> process, right? I get a data set, you know, and I, I push some button in PyTorch and out comes my model and great, but you right. know, the, like just, I, I don't, I don't, think I'm giving away any big secret, at least among the scientists of, of your viewers, that the amount of artisanal tinkering that goes into modern machine learning is just mind boggling. And in many ways is actually kind of increased with the rise of deep learning. Because you know, there's what's the architecture? How deep is the network? How wide is the network? What learning exactly rates, are the different activation units? Kind of what is the architecture between layers? Do you have convolutional units, et cetera, et cetera? And the, the honest truth is, is that, you know, even though we have rigorous and effective trained test methodology, the way the soup is made is there's a lot of trial and error and, you know, yeah. you vary things. And, and so sort of releasing just information about the data sets without sort of the context mm -hmm. of the rest of the training, I, th th I think we thought it would mislead customers in particular into kind of equating the training process with just the properties yeah. of the data set. You're kind and, of saying that, um, that uh, reproducibility as a goal is kind of intractable for what you were trying to accomplish. And so you didn't want yes, to provide exactly, right? so we, much detail right. that someone might want to reproduce. Exactly, exactly. Like we didn't want to give the illusion that we think these cards have enough information for you to go try to replicate what we yeah. did. They clearly don't. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and we also, you know, the, the other thing is the goal of these cards, I think even in their original conception as model cards in the, the paper that you you mentioned, you know, these are meant to be short and readable to a very wide audience. And so yeah. the more kind of technical minutia you get into, the longer these cards will become, the less they'll be, they'll, they won't be like cards anymore, they'll be like manuals. Yeah. Um, and the and the, uh, the audience for them will become more and more limited. I mean, um, many people have before offered the analogy of these are, you know, sort of like the analog of nutrition labels on food, mm -hmm. right? It's like ordinary shoppers should be able, you know, who care yeah. about it, should be able to pick it up and, you know, say like, oh, I don't, I don't like some of these ingredients or I'm allergic to them. Um, and so that, that's kind of the goal here. That being said, I do expect that as time goes on, we will, you know, our, our cards will evolve to say more about our data sets and mm -hmm. other topics as well, including possibly more quantitative information about demographic performance. Okay. One, one of the things that we've talk, talked thus far about naturally is um, data sets. It comes up a lot in this topic. Yeah. Uh, there was a period of time where there was a, a pretty vocal, contentious argument about uh, our algorithms bias versus our data sets biased. Uh, I think that was maybe a couple of years ago that that really flared up. Uh, are you still seeing that argument play out or what, what's your take there? Yeah, I mean, I, I think both of the things you said are true, right? So I definitely think it's true that if you have heavily biased data coming into your training process and you train models in the ordinary way that doesn't attempt to, you know, look for or correct that bias, then you should expect to get it in your model as well. That's what the models it, are doing. Yeah, it's not the only way though, right? I yeah. mean, um, I think maybe the more subtle point that um, is less widely realized or discussed is that I mean, first of all, every data set has some kind of bias, right? It might not be demographic right. bias, but it's gathered under certain conditions. And if you train a model on data under those conditions and then try running it um, on data from radically different conditions, you know, bad things will happen. It might not be demographic bias, but it'll certainly at least be poor performance. Right. But the other thing can happen is even if you have a data set that you've scrupulously, you know, verified is free of at least the demographic biases that you've checked for and care about, you could still end up with a trained model that was heavily biased against one or other, another demographic group. And the reason for this is that, again, I at a high level, it's pretty simple, right? Machine learning doesn't give you for free anything that you didn't explicitly ask for, and it also doesn't avoid things that you wanted to avoid that you didn't explicitly tell it to avoid. So mm -hmm. for instance, I'm training a large neural network on some data set that is free of demographic bias, whatever that means. Um, but you know, the training process is a journey through this very high dimensional parameter space looking for sort of the minimum error point on the data, right? And if it happens to be the case that you know, there's a 
point in per the, the, the point that minimizes the error in model space happens to do very poorly on some particular demographic group, even though there might have been a different point, even a nearby point in model space that had only slightly higher overall error, but did much better on that demographic group. Well, since you just said, no, find the minimum error, and you didn't mention anything about, like, by the way, if there happens to be a point you know, in model space that has only infinitesimally larger error, but does much better from a demographic fairness perspective than pick that one, yeah. then you're not going to get that, right? And so at a conceptual level, the solution to this is pretty straightforward, right? Instead of solving what we would, you know, in technical jargon call a straight up optimization problem, minimize the error in model space on the data, you solve a constrained optimization problem, right? Where the constrained optimization problem is minimize the error on the data subject to these fairness conditions. And this is where kind of the research gets interesting because, you know, you have to figure out, you know, this, these are computers and algorithms after all. I can't just sort of wave my hands and say I have to like be able to mathematically specify the same way that the error objective is mathematically specified. I need to be able to mathematically specify what the fairness constraints are. Mm -hmm. And there's more than one choice for what those constraints look like and those correspond to sort of different mathematical definitions of fairness. And there are different algorithmic ways of trying to sort of find a solution to this constraint optimization problem. And this has been sort of a subject of very, very active research over the past seven or so years. How does that uh, dichotomy, if, if that's the right term, play out in practice at a, a place like Amazon? And I guess I'm asking, are, are you know, biases in the data sets you know, top of mind and easier to root out than biases in the algorithmic process and, um, you know, or, or not so much. You just have to be aware that they're there and... Yeah, I don't think I have a, a, a binary answer to that question. I think my intuition is that, you know, especially in the era of deep learning, the training of models has become very, very computationally intensive and very expensive, and we are now training very, very large models. Mm -hmm. And so there is a complexity and opaqueness to that process that's, you know, in my mind, perhaps greater than the mysteries of the data set that goes into that process, right? I mean, yeah. usually if you have certain demographic groups in mind, and, and by the way, you have data annotated by those demographic groups, because if you don't know the demo, if you're, you know, if you say, okay, I want to, you know, um, make sure that I'm fair by race, for example, but the data I have is not annotated by race, I can't even audit, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we, you need that kind of data or some way or some proxy for that kind of data. But I feel like the problem of assessing whether a data set has bias um, is, is a, at this point, maybe a more straightforward problem than, you know, thinking about whether your training process might inadvertently lead to biases. And, you know, just to touch on a topic that we can discuss more if you want, a, a good example I would give is that, um, you know, you think about the rise of these very powerful generative models in the past few years, yeah. you know, large language models like GPT-3 and things like Dolly. Um, you know, you enter in some prefix text and, you know, it auto-completes with, you know, sentient, grammatically correct, you know, sometimes right. quite compelling text. I mean, I found in experimenting with these things. Is sentient you know, your opinion? You, 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 you put in, you, put in um, you know, if you type in prefix text that's kind of like you might have from a novel, it has emotional human content in it, you know, you yeah. get auto-completions that are like a short story and, right. you know, not always, but sometimes I've been sitting there thinking, you oh, know, this is pretty good. I think I want to keep reading this. Yeah. But of course, there's some limit on the on the length of the completion if you're using the open source version. So the short story sort of stops in mid sentence. But you know, if you think about what, for instance, fairness would even mean in these kind of large language models, I mean, we have a very good handle, mm. I think, in relative terms, scientifically on notions of fairness for simple prediction problems like classification or regression. But like, what would it mean for a large language model to be fair, right? I think this is an important scientific question that we are only beginning to kind of 
grapple with at all. And to say a little bit more about what I mean, you know, I could give you very, very narrow senses in which I might ask for a language model to be fair. Mm -hmm. So for example, uh, in my own kind of anecdotal experimentation with some of these models, I find that if you type in some prefix of text that mentions an ungendered name, like Chris, for instance, but you don't use any pronouns, so you haven't committed to the gender of Chris, it almost always auto-completes with male pronouns, yeah. okay? So I could say, okay, you know, a fair language model should, you know, for this list of ungendered names in North America, have a roughly equal mixture of pronouns in the auto-completion. But when you is think that about the distribution of Chris's, huh? is that the gender distribution of Chris? I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. You know, you, so you could ask whether it should match or you know, or what what it is. Right. Just to. But but the, my point here is is that you know anybody who's played around with these things would almost certainly criticize what I just proposed as like, oh my God, that is just such a narrow definition of fairness, mm -hmm. given the power and the complexity of the output of these models. And I think that critique would be right, but that's kind of, you know, that's where our thinking is right now. And I think, you know, th this is an area that is going to present a great challenge to the research community in coming years. Mm -hmm. Have you seen any early research attempting to address the question? Well, I mean, you do have the famous, you know, word embedding paper from, I think, roughly 2015 or 2016. Um, but I still think of that, which it's a very nice paper and a very influential paper, but it's still kind of talking about one particular kind of bias, right, which is kind of the association with, uh, between gender and occupations and, right. and other, you know, sort of other um, parts of speech. Um, and so, you know, I think something that we think about a lot is like toxicity in language models and is this model, you know, generating slightly more negative sentiment completions when prompted with, you know, um, one type of prompt may be related to some demographic group or identity versus another. An another really interesting thing is, you know, and this is why I think this area is so fertile um, for both research and just, you know, even as a society thinking about these problems. There have been a couple of recent papers in which the use case of a large language model was really deliberately to replicate the biases and correlations that are present in society. So in one that just came out like a month or so ago, um, the authors basically, there, there's, I can't remember the name of it. it. I don't think it's the American Census Survey. It's some other, there's some, you know, long-standing survey um, that some organization does. I'm blanking on the exact name of it, but, but the details are less important than what they did. This organization goes out and interviews Americans on their views on various topics. Mm -hmm. So they will go out and sit down with real citizens, take demographic information, like this is a housewife, you know, age 45, who lives in the Midwest, and then they'll, you know, so they'll collect a bunch of demographic information, and then they'll ask the subject their views on things like gun control and abortion and other controversial topics, okay? And they publish these things at some cadence. And so in this paper about a month ago, they basically used, a, they tried to use a large language model to replicate the numerical findings of such a survey hmm. by designing prompts. And those prompts would say something like, well, you know, Christina is a housewife who lives in the Midwest. Her attitude on gun control is, and then they, you know, push the large language model button. And then they elicit from that some response, and then they tabulated them. Yeah. And the upshot was that you know they found that you could pretty up, uh, could approximately fairly well replicate the numerical findings of the actual survey by the LLM. Mm -hmm. And the reason I'm going down this rabbit hole is that this is a use case. We can you know people can decide whether they think this is a productive use case or not. But this is a use case in which you wouldn't want the the LLM to have been eradicated for any kinds of correlations, for instance, between where people live and their views on certain topics or their yeah. gender in certain topics. And so it's easy to sort of say like, oh, well, fairness should sort of eradicate these types of correlations that exist in society. But there might, it could be that the most valuable use cases actually are to capture those biases in these very powerful systems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is 
thinking about that from a practical perspective, you're, you're painting a picture in which perhaps um, part of the way these language models are you know, rolled out and used more broadly is you know, controlling for the bias of the language model based on the needs of a particular use case. And um, you know, from that perspective, to your point, there's no single, the, the goal isn't even a single definition of right. fairness. It's right. fairness with regards to a use case and you design for that. Yeah. Is that how you see things? Yeah, out? I mean, it, but but I mean, uh, I mean, so you, I guess I could imagine a future in which, you know, the user of an LLM goes to some dashboard and sort of, you know, sets sets a bunch of dials in a way that like, okay, you know, I, I don't, I, I, I want you to preserve the bias between gender and, you know, or the correlation between gender and attitudes on gun control. Or even you know, I want the output of this to be rated R versus rated PG-13 versus rated yeah, G. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And sort of toxicity, of course, is a whole other, you know, separate can of worms than yeah. fairness. And, um, you know, these are very, very thorny issues. And so, yeah. you know, it, it's an interesting time because as, as the power of these things has grown, you know, to the point that, you know, even people in the field like me can be amazed by what they can do. Um, you know, there's this sense that, okay, there's some very interesting conceptual and science questions here, but there's also a pretty serious responsibility on the AI community to, you know, control this stuff and to, you know, and to set guidelines for its use and to decide what use cases are appropriate and decide what kinds of generative models we should even be building at all, even though it might be possible. Um, and so I think, you know, in many ways, these generative models have kind of pushed to the fore some very, very difficult questions that weren't quite present when we were just building powerful models for making point predictions. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Michael, it's been wonderful to have yeah. an opportunity to chat with you yeah. here. Yeah, I think we did a pretty good uh, approximation to our New York dinner conversation. <laughs> so it's, it's been a pleasure, and I hope to, hope to see you again soon, maybe at a dinner in New York. My pleasure. Thank okay, you. Thank you.